So welcome everyone on our November um, uh, research seminar series of Health and Society. And we are really pleased to have Dr. Brian Moss, uh, Moss um, presenting um, his research on public libraries. So I would like to introduce uh, Brian. And I actually met Brian in um, September uh, at the European Criminology Conference. And I was very fascinated with his talk. And then I requested him to come and share his research uh, with us. So Brian, uh, Dr. Brian Moss is a sociologist working on the topic of crime and deviance. Brian has worked at universities in the UK and Ireland and is a fellow of the Higher, Ac Higher Education Academy. He has held research and probation officers roles in Ireland and Belgium and acted as reviewer on several journals. His research has focused on policing and probation topics, appearing in international journals and in trade and media outlets. Brian currently heads up research at the Irish Legal Aid Board and is an external examiner at a university in England. So over to you, Brian. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the, for the opportunity to speak today on my, this topic. Um, what I'll do is, and again, correct me, I'll speak for about 40 odd minutes, uh, 45 minutes, and some time for questions and answers, which there will be some, and then go from there. And if there are any follow up, from any students or staff. I've left my email address in the bottom slide there. So to begin my story, and I've entitled this a likely story, trying to fill in a bit of a pun there, I suppose, around library use, and a likely story, crime and disorder in public libraries. This is based on a research uh, study that I began in late 2021 and through 2022, and I'm hopefully wrapping it up in the next month or two. And it's very much uh, focused on the issue of crime and disorder in public libraries in the UK. And um, what I'd like to do over the next kind of 40, 45 minutes is very much give you kind of try and cover six key points of my study and um, with a view to showing how it emerged, how it came together and the, the items that came out from my stakeholders point of views and then what I found in the field work so far. And then pushing on a little bit, trying to preempt um, where my study might go and, and how the findings might have impact over time. Um, what I would try and do is very much break up my time across these six evenly with a view to ensuring that there's a, there's a fair balance of what it is I've said and what, what it is I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to do and the message I'm trying to convey. So ultimately, uh, beginning where all good stories begin, um, this story begins very much in um, beyond the textbooks and beyond kind of the, beyond the idea of formulated idea about research. I was actually based at the time in the University of Southampton. I have a picture here, kind of the side angle side uh, profile of the universe, of the library itself, the central, central library in Southampton, based down in Southampton city centre. And the research here, and um, what I was doing at the time was there was um, the uh, academic staff were striking the UK universities, um, and my university included, so we weren't passing the pickets. And I was, um, during the daytime, keep myself busy, keep my, as I was kind of living in a, in a, in a small flat by myself, and um, I would go down and kind of just use facilities in, in the city centre and try and kind of take over some research work that I was trying to do on other topics around policing. And one day at the university, one evening, um, I noted that there was quite a degree of shouting going on. This was kind of in, contained in the main reading room of the library. And I pricked my ears and this, the noise kind of went on for about five or six minutes. And then I could see library staff coming out trying to engage with a particular individual um, and kind of settle the things, the concerns that they had and move on from there. But over the kind of subsequent days as I was in and out of the library, I noticed that there were time and again, there were similar incidents. There was drinking going on in the toilet. There were people hanging outside the library itself. There were obviously people who were homeless. And it struck me that there were a range of issues and the librarians were having to take kind of a, a front foot here and deal with these and manage these. And this very much set the basis for my uh, study. And I'll uh, kind of outline this as I go along. But it was very much here kind of um, beyond the textbook, as I put it, and Fabi, there's a very good textbook there that I think it's in its 15th edition now by Fabi about the research process. It kind of you follow through kind of a set number of steps from your initial conception or idea through to um, your re literature review and so on and so on through gathering the data right until you get to the end of your project. And what struck me straight away from this project as a kind of as idea as I sat here was that this wasn't linear, this wasn't something that I preconceived, it wasn't something that I had, had in mind. But um, the more that I read into this idea over the coming days, 
again, things I could download materials from the Southampton Library. Um, it's a university library, and the more I could read and reflect upon this, the more I noticed that this was an idea that didn't have any kind of real great basis, so to speak, or coverage within the UK context. There was some literature in New Zealand and Canada and the USA and Australia, but very, very little covered in the UK. So I had an idea. I saw something that was happening in the UK libraries, and I thought that this was something that I needed to look up for my books, so to speak, to engage in this and try and figure out, well, look, was there more to it? Was it worth my while looking at it? As someone who is a sociologist who is interested particularly in the sociology of deviants and crime. Was there something that I could do and something that there was a real idea behind it? Was there any stakeholders, any interested parties that I could look at and see whether there's an idea worth looking further into? So rather than getting my hands dirty there, um, and again, I was sitting in the library, kind of a nice warm, clean environment. You know, over the last kind of two years, libraries have become a real haven, a safe haven for many populations, both in terms of warmth, but in terms of further kind of social services. I wanted to see if there was something I could do. So in terms of getting my hands dirty, the very first thing I did was I contacted and they contacted one of the librarians there. Um, and they gave me a bit of time in the library and told me kind of what they were experiencing, anecdotally at least. Um, and also then what I could do and how possibly I could kind of progress the project further or what they what would be might be willing to give me access to. So from there, really, my idea began to become something more than just something I'd seen in the library, something that had kind of broken my piece and the piece of other librarians. It became a worry, it became a concern, it became something that I really wanted to act upon. And, and there were two kind of main concerns that I had at that time. One was obviously the librarians who were kind of having to stand up and face these issues that they were seeing on a day to day basis. And the second was the population that were using the libraries. And as I read and as I kind of uh, saw my idea, more and more ideas came to mind. But I'll come to that in a, in a second or two. Just in terms of getting my hands dirty, there was always that concern in the back of my head that I might be blowing something out of proportion and I'm like taking an idea kind of perversely or, or pursuing it where there was really no story. And again, that's why I titled this particular presentation, A Likely Story. Um, two bits of research that kind of really strike to mind in terms of kind of going on the edge or moving away from, um, I suppose, the mainstream would be that by Lord Humphreys, The Tea Room Trade, which talks about um, sexual activity in public toilets in LA in the 1970s, and more recently work by Alice Goffman in terms of kind of living on the edge and kind of people who commit crime or are involved in crime, and how far we can go in terms of that research and how far we kind of, we might muddy the story or keep the story genuine and pure. So I was conscious when I started this idea, an area which I had no previous conception, but I need to fully understand what it was all about. I need to fully understand who the interested parties might be before I could go to progress it on to become a full research idea, if there was a story there to pursue it all. So what was the issues that I was looking at or what was I primarily concerned with? Well, um, fundamentally, as I said to you, I could see things happening in the library on a, on a daily basis. And there were these items around um, disorder, but as I progressed even further, there was issues about crime, drug use taking, drinking alcohol, and then there was um, damage of property that had been related to me then by the, the librarian whom I engaged with in Southampton. But as I looked at it, there was a wider set of challenges that really merited consideration. And that I, again, as I looked from the literature quite quickly, that there didn't seem to be any real core or composite or clear cover job in the UK context. And the widening challenges that librarians seem to be facing were an increasing use or prevalence of um, library users with drug use, mental health issues, and homelessness. Um, but I need to be very, very clear, rather than just blaming all the issues on these people, these marginal users in the library, I need to figure out, well, look, was the crime a disorder that I was hearing? Was it actually from stable library users? Was it from teenagers? Was it from adults? Where was all this incidence of disorder coming from? And much like the stories that I've listed here on the right-hand side of my screen, um, was it there similar to issues that were happening in Philadelphia? And where the headlines that were emerging at the time around Britain and the closure of libraries and the, um, the hubs of chaos that are occurring in libraries, was there any real basis to this? Or was it, again, the newspapers kind of just going off on a hoof and kind of running with any old story that kind of pleased them? And as I looked at this issue of the, um, the libraries, I began to try and put it in a wider context. And what I realized quite quickly was that if we looked at what had been happening in Britain over the last decade, from kind of 2010 to 2020 into 2021 when I started looking at this issue. There seemed to be the decline of the strength of the local fabric. And by this, but I mean local services. So why all of a sudden were we seeing a huge number of, what I could see, 
people with mental health issues, drug use, and those who are homeless using the libraries on a day in, day out basis. And there are two very clear reasons that seem to emerge quite quickly. One was libraries have always been welcoming spaces. And this is something that I've picked up in interviews and librarians have always been very keen to stress this to me, whether um, it's in Ireland or whether it is in the UK as well. Um, but libraries have always been welcoming spaces and whether it was um, the, the Irish poet um, Patrick Kavanagh or it was the English writer um, George Orwell, they've all used uh, libraries at times when they had very little money or for places of refuge and human warmth. The second aspect of this decline of the local is very much the fact that um, on a fact basis, and without getting into the politics between uh, different political parties in the UK, there had been a decline in public finances available to local authorities and the spend thereafter on social services at, at local level from 2010 to 2020, and this has been documented by the UK Parliament. So there's been a real fall off in social services, a closing down of certain services, and hollowing out, if you like, of um, local services that are provided. And in its place then, what was left were libraries to try and kind of shore up or to provide whatever service they could. And I'll look at this deep, uh, issue in a bit more detail, but already my head was beginning to work at, at kind of at the process or at the item a bit like this. If there is a spike in people who have marginal issues and uh, particularly uh, extreme needs using libraries and libraries are closing, uh, as they have been over the prior decade, what might that do then to the standard middle class or other library users who tend to use libraries? Will they be afraid to use the libraries? Will they move away from the libraries? And if they move away from the libraries, are libraries then likely to lose customers and therefore the pressure on them to close even further libraries exacerbate even further? Simply put, I was concerned with the impacts of libraries helping people marginal users might have on their own existence and whether they could do both things at the same time. And this has remained a full, core or fundamental concern to my study as it's gone along. But back to the issue about crime and disorder and taking that as a principal concern because that was my instinctive and leading off point. And um, was my story, was my question, was my interest in libraries anything more than just newsworthy? Was it just a headline or was there anything more substance to it than that? And if we start to put this again into context about what's happening in the UK over the last decade, we know that there's been legislation brought in recently around the Assault of Emergency Workers Offensive Act 2019. This is primarily around protecting police and hospital workers. And if we look at that problem and put it into a wider context, well, does it also protect people like library workers? Have they been a feature of this campaign? And very quickly in engaging with one of the primary stakeholders of our product, and at an early stage, what I found out from them was that, look, We've anecdotal evidence from libraries across the UK that people are, the libraries are experiencing more issues of crime disorder, both to themselves and broadly to the wider library. The second aspect there is that while we have submitted this to the Home Office, the Home Office wasn't interested at the time in an exercise conducted in 2020. What the Home Office was interested in was retail workers at that point in time. So the librarians as a whole, as a sector, felt that they needed to put their lot in with retail workers not quite the same sector, but it was as close as they could get if they were to be heard by the, uh, the UK government. In the final document that emerged from the UK government around retail workers and crime, I suppose in retail shops, there's no mention there of libraries, the librarian sector, library sector as a whole wasn't represented. So in short, the stakeholders felt that they were being overlooked by government, that this was a growing problem and not one that they could address by themselves, but they would also like some assistance in figuring out what, what were staff feeling on the ground, what were they seeing, and what could be a proper response? How could they influence government? So in terms of making this more than just a newsworthy story, um, yes, policing is bigger. Yes, prison officers are bigger. And yes, hospitals are bigger. <clears throat> but at the same time, the library network is much larger across the UK. As far as I can make out, there were at one point, and probably still are, some 3,000 libraries in the UK, which is much more than hospitals, police stations across the UK. So librarians arguably have much more exposure Granted, they might, be, might be experiencing the same levels of assault, and the figures here that I quote from left to right are in respect of police officers, and then prison officers, and then nursing sector or uh, healthcare sector. But what we didn't know was what were librarian workers experiencing? What was the incident of crimes or assaults? Or what was the incident of injury, for example? What was the impact on staff? We simply didn't know, and this was beginning to form, I suppose, the basis to my key research question. So my research first became, what is the incidence and nature of abuse against library staff? It was very much um, an exploratory question, trying to figure out a first basis for this matter within the UK, try and move beyond the headlines and engage with stakeholders and give them something more solid. So very quickly, I put out some feelers to um, two main library stakeholders in the UK, Libraries Connected and SILIP, 
Um, and I found them to be both quite open to the idea and um, particularly libraries connected. They gave me a huge amount of assistance in the early stages and um, in terms of being able to facilitate um, the idea as a whole, <clears throat> but also then they were interested in the fact that I might try and put forward this project for funding, which would very much give a kind of a solid basis to my study and I'd go from there. So in terms of funding, um, I made an application to the British Academy Labour Hume Small Grant Fund, um, and I was successful with that. And this enabled me to undertake, um, what under, enabled me to undertake travel across the UK um, to devote quite a bit of time to putting this together and to put aside some kind of research materials that I might need to gather in information, basically produce a report on this. And then after that, to have impact with uh, different stakeholders across the sector, whether it was um, through government level or also using at a local level. Um, and I'll come to that kind of towards the end of my presentation. So my idea was very much forming into a, into a proposal. And as I mentioned just before we start this, this uh, session today, um, when I get put out my proposal um, to kind of a consultant in the early stages that was provided um, by the university where I worked. And um, a group of us put in proposals to see, look, is there a basis here? What do we need to rejig it? And um, is there anything that I can prove upon? And I'm happy to say while the consultant um, shot down my proposal entirely, um, the Bridge Academy and Labour Dream saw some merit in my, in my proposal and I secured the funding there um, to undertake the study itself. So with thanks to the British Academy, um, I was at least able to kind of lay out what it is I was going to do, I had a clear timeline, clear ideas, and off I'd go. So in particular, what I was interested in reviewing um, for the proposal and getting very clear ideas across my projects, because um, as I mentioned there, while I had an instinctive concern about what was happening in libraries and the impact then this would have on other library users and the impact that that would have then on library closures, and so on, and that kind of that cycle of being able of local authority supports for local social services. I really had to get my head together in terms of what I would look at in terms of literature review. Now, I won't go into, the, into these individually, but what I did was I tried to, as I'm a sociologist, one interested in crime, but I've also done, done some interdisciplinarity work at the University of Southampton previously. I was concerned to make sure that I had all my ducks lined up, that I knew all the areas that I needed to consider to try and draw the best proposal and understand the ideas fully. So what I've just provided there is an overview of key topics or key areas that I looked at in financing of local authorities to see was this issue real across to the issue of crime and libraries. And there's quite a little bit of work there, but not a huge extensive piece of work, not recent. And across the issues of poverty in terms of who uses and what's probably looking like at the local level. And then into homelessness and homeless users and homelessness, homeless users of libraries more broadly. Finally, then, there's an important aspect of all of this. I've talked about the whittling out or the hollowing out of the local authority sector as a whole over the last decade. And what I really just need to know was, in a worst case scenario, if more libraries were trying to assist people with particular social needs, and this, then this put in uh, pressure on library users who then moved on to other services, and libraries became places that nobody was using and therefore had to shut down, what would this do if we lacked libraries? What is the fundamentally, I suppose my question is, what would we do if we had no libraries in place or if more and more libraries disappeared? And this brings it to a kind of a wider communitarian or kind of social fabric idea, but I think it was vital and it's a, it still plays an aspect of my study. While it's not directed to the crime and deviance, it does still tell us something about um, the role that libraries have as acting as a buffer against a kind of crime and deviance, assisting people, but also in terms of keeping that kind of fabric of, of society in the local community in place. So without, again, without getting into theoretical basis of my study, and the reason I mentioned the theoretical basis is because I've read several reviews um, as a reviewer of journal articles, but also as, as a lecturer and as a dissertation uh, supervisor at universities, where there's lacked any theoretical basis or lacked any clear idea what, what we're talking about. I, three, I identified three concerns here that I think would have application both to my stakeholders and to my study as a whole. And the first one is about called what, what's called right realism. And right realism essentially is about preventing crime. It's about introducing lockdown procedures or methods where you can keep crime um, to a minimum. An example is locked doors, locked windows when you go off to work. An example is uh, CCTV in a public library. And whether this will resolve all the crime, keep the crime to a minimum, or does it have any impact at all? The second main theory is about communitarianism, which is that, that role of what does the community do? How does it come together? What are the services that it brings? But what, what is it that, that brings out the best in the community and what represents what a community does and how do you keep that social fabric in place that people look out for one another and assist one another? 
And the final element there is about this public sphere. What role is it that a library should do in effect in raising issues to the, to the fore in highlighting these issues of whether it's crime and deviance or it's the social service needs that, that I had talked about that I'd seen in Southampton. How are these things brought to the fore and then how are they addressed by the relevant authorities, whether it's at a local level or at the national level? So this was the literature view. This is my theoretical basis. And what I need to do is compact this in along with my, the views of my stakeholders and try and bring together, as I said, get some ethical approval behind it, which I did from the University of Southampton, and then get support from these stakeholders again, which I did. And this led me through then to having a clear um, policy, uh, I should say proposal in place, which was assisted by what's called public policy Southampton. Uh, I mentioned this because it comes in at the very end of the presentation. I think it has a vital role. Public policy Southampton is all about making sure that research just isn't navel gazing, it just isn't research for research sake, but it actually goes somewhere that actually changes something. And part of my proposal was based around getting the assistance from public policy Southampton to um, be able to go to uh, conferences, to presentations, to engage in um, activities and events on the ground, and then ultimately to influence government. And public policy Southampton is all about um, assisting researchers to put, I suppose, their findings in clear messages and to deliver that to the relevant stakeholders and to try to influence what happens down the line. And while it wasn't my primary concern, ultimately to, to engage with someone like Public Policy of Santa, I found it very, very useful to do that so that my research could have value. And that's one of the key things emerging from any academic research is to have value. In terms of my stakeholders, the initial talks that I had with them wasn't just about reassuring them, I suppose, getting their buy into the project, but also up to the point of conducting some interviews with them. I needed to reassure them, particularly people who hadn't met with or engaged with directly, that I would treat their data with confidence, that the story that they were telling me, I wasn't a particular answer, but just their story, their take, and that how I would go about trying to use this material to, um, I suppose, change what I saw at the moment, which was what I saw to be a particular type of problem, which was librarians under pressure to deal with these um, people who had marginal, exceptional and marginal leads in the, in the libraries. So as I found myself at the stakeholders, as I say, it wasn't just kind of the formal level of policy proposal stage, but it was also engaging with people just prior to interview and then reassuring them and allaying any fears that they had. As with any stakeholders, I've gained some, I've lost some as I've gone along. Um, and in terms of any students or staff, kind of who might be seeing this, they will have maybe have had similar experiences themselves. Um, my key early engagement um, with Southampton hasn't, uh, and Central Library hasn't quite followed through as I had hoped to date, but I've had gained other sources from the likes of Kent, and again, I won't give any names in particular, but I've had some very, very useful people in Kent and also people in Wales as well, who said, look, come over to us, give us a shout what you need, and we'll kind of direct you the right way. So all throughout the research process, the stakeholders have been a vital part of what I do in terms of the vital success of what I'm hoping will be achieved and um, come the new year with, as this project winds itself up. But to get into my field work. So my field work itself, I um, use what is called, so sometimes you'll hear about debate between quantitative and qualitative studies. Mine was very much um, delivered or sold to uh, the British Academy in the Room as being a mixed method design. That is, I would use both qual and quant, and particularly there's various different types of mixed methods. My proposal was that I would use convergent mixed methods design. That is that both would inform the other, one would not come before the other one, and that they would kind of would share the story across from the surveys that I hope to do, across the interviews and from the interviews across to the surveys, and that ultimately I would end up with a composite picture of all the results that I was finding and try and scratch my head and figure out what was the overall story that I was getting. So the work here in mixed methods design, I won't go into it, but Cresswell has been a, a key kind of proponent of this. And it's something that I've engaged in very, very slowly to make sure that I get it right. And the reason I say that is because the survey that I proposed to undertake and did undertake has been very, very different from the interviews. The online survey that I proposed with Libraries Connected and then with Philip, I ran it past them to get their input to make sure they were happy with the questions, that the questions in terms made sense. And ultimately, um, Libraries Connected roughly has approximately 9,000 members. And I was hoping, gee, because it's a great, and a great kind of scenario, I'd get all 9,000 members. But look, that wasn't the case to be. Um, Libraries Connected did their very best kind of to, to push and to, to push out my survey um, online. So it was trying to think of the easiest way for librarians to, to respond to it. Um, and I'll come to that in a second. And the interviews, um, I'd hope to conduct the interviews on site. Um, and I was going to divide these across different areas, urban, 
peri-urban, rural areas, and so on. And the Office for National Statistics covering the UK, or England and Wales, I should say, covers eight different supergroups or eight different types of areas. And my, my new original design was to run interviews across different types of areas. Again, as we'll see, um, that hasn't happened quite as, as neatly as I would have hoped. And that's why I put in the picture here on the top. We always have a great plan about how simple it is, how, how close the, the finish line looks. But in reality, the reality has been much different. Starting with myself, very, very briefly, um, I had to leave my post in Southampton for personal reasons. Um, I have a family here in Ireland and uh, family was calling. So I had to leave my post in Southampton, which meant that the on-site delivery of interviews and that kind of thing would get much harder and much more difficult. I've kept the research going and that's been very much the cooperation, the assistance of Libraries Connected since then. Um, and eager librarians, and there may be a few here today who might be willing to help me out afterwards. But I have gotten in the survey that I issued, it was issued in um, uh, last winter, um, and then I've been conducting the interviews and putting together some results from, since then. So keeping an eye on time, um, I'll, I'll run through these, but very, very briefly, so to speak, my study hope to go with the flow, a bit like um, two great trees in the winds, whereas an oak tree and a great wind is known to crack and break. The willow tree will bend and flap the wind and go with the flow. My study overall has to go with the flow a little bit here. Um, the online survey that I projected to do has to take place, but less numbers were secured. The interviews that I project, projected to do on site in libraries across the UK to get a feel of what the actual site looks like, to get a feel of how people would interact and what it looked like outside the library, hasn't quite come to bear. But again, I'm still planning ahead with those. What I have done, what I have received, and this is probably the two most interesting slides for anyone watching today, are the results from the survey. And then after this, I'll give you a quick overview of the results from the interviews. In brief, I had 218 responses, um, and this came from 56 different areas across the UK, mainly in England and Wales. I had one or two from Scotland, but not a huge amount. And again, this feeds back into the early story that um, I kind of got from Scottish in, 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 in touch with a few Scottish contacts. What they said to me was, we have things very, very different up here in Scotland. We're not seeing the same sort of levels of crime, disorder, or chaos in the libraries, but they are in England and Wales. We have a different story. And secondly, they said our engagements or multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships with different social services are much more concrete, much more in place. And often the example I've given was of Glasgow Central Library. Um, and there the example given to me was that there were um, homeless services were linked in the social services, were linked in the library, they were linked in the police and health services and so on, with a full range of team in place. And that these kind of things were much more sporadic in England and Wales. So that aside, um, what did I find from the survey from the responses that I got back? I have listed here a number of um, findings. What I'm not going to do is go read them out ad nauseum. I think that would bore you um, more than it would bore me. What I will do though is, and I highlight a couple of them in bold writing, and I'll just very briefly go through these. So as an example, and um, the first bullet there, 76% of the respondents had experienced a challenging interaction with library users within the last, and 82% of it within the last year. So over three quarters had experienced some sort of interaction where they felt, I'm under pressure here, or I'm, under, I'm at risk, or I'm at fear. And um, so that incident is, I think, as a first figure, as a first measure of this scenario, of the picture that we're looking at is quite informative. In terms of the second finding, um, thankfully, most of the abuse that librarians have experienced is only verbal. I do use that in kind of an inverted commas. 7% has been physical and verbal, and 1% has purely just been physical. So in short, about 8% of the librarians who have experienced some sort of physical or some sort of abuse have experienced a degree of physical abuse there. Um, and in one case, I was at a session um, in August where the library is connected. One senior librarian had outlined how, excuse me, he had had a knife put on him at one point in time. And he was a few years into his career and he, he wasn't that worried, but it was still that thought of, I'm at work, I'm in a, what's meant to be a safe, warm, municipal, cultural place, and what does the knife being pulled on me? So this does have an impact. Um, and perhaps quite shocking in some ways is the next line where one in five of people expected to have to deal with the scenario, that interaction with a member of the public, they expect to have to deal with that themselves rather than have direct support from management or from policing or security services, wherever it might be. Moving then then to what support people felt after the fact um, of having such an interaction with a member of the public, 50% felt that the libraries were doing enough, whereas the other 50% of my uh, respondents felt that they weren't. So what you can clearly see there is a clear split down the middle there about 
how people feel that libraries are dealing with, have policies in place or dealing with these or have staff welfare to mind. And I think this is one of the key issues that when going back to Libraries Connected, that I think we're really raising an issue for them is, what is your position? And um, what is it you you might be able to do about this very split line between your members about who feel that they're getting enough support and those who are not, who, are, who feel that they're not getting enough support. And then finally, the final headline, just to point out there is my last one bold, the very last point is about the primary library role. And I think this was interesting because I wanted to see how far would people go to librarians go to support these people with uh, marginal users with particularly exceptional needs like drug use, mental health, homelessness, and so on. And the response here I think is quite interesting. 42% felt that the libraries primarily serve as community hub, less so than the libraries about reading and IT facilities. I think this is quite interesting in and of itself. And then interesting again, this differs slightly from perspectives in Australia, where people very much feel that and um, community hub is a much higher role of what they do, and reading and, and IT would be less again. So there's a, a perspective there, not just in England and Wales, a split perspective on what the library's function is, but also internationally. And I think this is important to bear in mind as we go along and as this study wraps itself up. So into the kind of the, the last two slides, if I may. In terms of interviews, um, I've conducted nine interviews so far, and I have three on the books still to go, and hopefully there'll be more thereafter. What I've tried to focus on is very much a kind of management and uh, staff working on the ground. And what I've received so far back for invitations are very much from managers and, and less so from staff, kind of um, people who are may not, may not be in a high management position, but also may have real experience to tell me about what they felt on the ground and what they've seen on the ground. Um, and then after that, my intention, my original intention of the proposal, I should say, was for 14 interviews, uh, and four of those would be with local authority heads. My intention is still to involve those local authority heads, people who are connected with the libraries, but not working in libraries towards the latter stages of my project. Because I think it's interesting and important to get the perspective of those who overall control and manage and finance services, not just those who are working in the services themselves. My interviews have been conducted over MS Team platform because this is the most secure platform. And since I've moved out of the University of Southampton, um, there's been different options there about different platforms. And um, what I would say is I'm still sticking with MS Teams. I have access to that. And it remains a secure way for me to provide confidence to my respondents that they, what the information they give me will be contained in a, a kind of a password protected site um, and that I can kind of control and, and retain the, the information as safe as possible and remove my identifying details from themselves. What have I found in the interviews? In brief, um, I think there are five messages that come out for me from the interviews so far. The first one is that crime and disorder does happen in the libraries. It is not a likely story. It is happening day in, day out across the UK. The second story is that it does have an impact on staff and readers. But generally speaking, this tends to be a, a low impact. Staff are able to experience an issue and either think about it for a day or two or kind of deal with it for a day or two, but then move on with their library without it be in the interaction affecting them too much into the future as they progress then kind of after days, after weeks, after months and so on. The third thing coming out is that libraries had already physically undergone, um, COVID had already changed libraries in terms of the service that they deliver. So what they're seeing now is it was already reduced short a footfall in a way that that is bouncing back a little bit as I understand it quite a bit, but COVID had changed how libraries are used there's much more use for services online, and therefore there's less people, so to speak, presenting at the counter of the physical counters. And, and this will vary per library and per different areas in the libraries. But because there are less people there, there's, a, there's I suppose, a perspective or a hope that there'll be less um, interference or less effect on library users if they don't see these incidents of chaos or disorder or crime occurring in the libraries themselves. The next point is that many librarians I spoke to almost down to the last person has said, we do not want to increase more security. There's been a question around CCTV, but they do not want to have more security cards. They do not want to have more closed off sections of the library. They do not want to have um, have to be calling police in. They, were, don't, they don't want that kind of police presence, that security presence on site. They prefer to see themselves in the library, accessible and open to all and as a friendly welcoming place. The concern is that if they continue to experience or these headlines continue to pressure government to act in a certain way or local authorities to act in a certain way. There may be a bit of a, I suppose, a tension there between what librarians believe and would like to be their design and what then is being imposed upon them. Finally then, in terms of people who have exceptional needs, who are marginal users of the library, 
homelessness, drug addiction, um, mental health issues, and so on. Most librarians that I've spoken to in the interview, which differs somewhat from the, from the survey, most librarians I've spoken to has said that they would love to continue to assist and to expand and to formalize um, multi-stakeholder perspectives or working relationships in terms of assisting people like these who use the libraries on a day-to-day -day basis. They appreciate their life. job is not just books, there's much more to it, and to do that, they feel that they need more formal supports in place. So overall, and the bottom line here of my slides is taken from a, a, a professor that I had on my PhD. And in the space of two minute conversation with me, he had looked through all my data and he sat down and he said, Brian, look, the data's fine, but tell your story. Don't forget to tell your story. And that's the question I'm gonna enter into my last slide. What is it about my story? What is it I wanna tell? Well, I'd like my story to be simply that crime is not just a likely story and even so much as a likely story in the libraries, it does happen. But it also gets a bit muddier there when we think about recent issues that are happening to libraries in recent times. And by this, very briefly, what I mean is, I, uh, while I need to look at budgets that are going around, I also need to make sure that they're not distracting me from the core issue, the core focus that I have about crime and demons in libraries. And by this, what I mean is the LGBTQ plus issue that's emerging. Increasingly, and this is a story from the, an Irish broadsheet on Swords is an area uh, just in North Dublin, it's about 15 minute drive uh, uh, behind me. So the North Dublin has all of a sudden, where this was a very quiet library, very decent area, all of a sudden experiencing issues over um, censorship of books, like the demand of censorship of books by certain factions of the local population. But this just doesn't have, hasn't just been in Swords, it's been in Cork in the south uh, west of Ireland. And there's a response here, there's a concerns emerging about the reaction of police, that police aren't doing enough to protect libraries, to protect, the, to, I suppose, the the, the, the openness of library material that is on shelves. And the reason I raise this LGBTQ plus issue or the issue of censoring is because it's not just happening in Ireland. We've seen it in different aspects of England and Wales. We've also increasingly seen it in the USA, particularly southern states of the USA. And there's a concern and connection here about far right political activity. And whether this is a new facet alongside the marginal needs that, or users that librarians are going to have to deal with, is now this issue of politicization of, of, of material and the censorship of material. I have some links there about whether this res the replace response is lapsed and my survey and interviews with both time that there's a concern of the police activity and the involvement in stemming this crime and evils. But ultimately, if we add in this latest issue about LGBTQ plus issue, there's another story emerging in my head. However, as I say, what I wanna do is focus on the key issue here. And my key issue here is about the crime and evils in public libraries in the UK. So is this the end of my line? How do my survey results, do my interview results simply sum up my thing and, and that's my project done? Well, what I would say is no. And um, it's through engaging conferences like this, through engaging the conference in Florence and um, early in September, or through the British Sociological Association in March, where I've picked up one or two key ideas or one or two kind of tips and assistance for pro progressing my project and for um, developing it a bit further, thinking about further research down the line. There's also publications, and my aim is to produce journal publications um, and engage where possible with practitioner act activities uh, or practitioner um, reading materials and writing materials. And as I mentioned, there's further research. While I would hope that my folks today at Crime and Evils have given an, an overview of it, as I say, there are other issues around the library issue that really need to be borne out and really need to be commented upon. So what do I hope to do with all this research, all this survey, all these interviews, all this kind of thinking and talking and liaising with different people that have done so far. I'm hugely and immensely grateful to the people that have given me their time. Um, but ultimately what I've said to them was, look, my aim ultimately, while I'm in a slightly different position compared to where I was in the University of Southampton a year ago, my aim is still to, when I produce a publication, to submit this into local authorities, to submit this, submit this into central government, and um, I'll submit this back to my key stakeholders, including Silip and libraries connected. There's also a thing that touches the public, which is called the ESRC Festival of Social Science. Now, while I kind of, because I've removed out of the university, this is no longer available to me, I think there's still grounds there, and I, I can see a connection with a project that's ongoing with the political science department in the University of Southampton about bringing this idea back to bear and informing the public about where their money goes when they support research and to highlight these issues about the abuse and civility disorder that is happening in libraries and their efforts to try and deal with this and what might be the future what might we lose if we lose more libraries? And finally, I mentioned Public Policy Southampton earlier on. Public Policy Southampton helps researchers to put together messages to send them into central government. Before I finished up in Southampton, 
an overview or synopsis of my research was sent in as a letter to the brand new, although short lived government of Liz Trucks. And what I was saying to her brand new government was, look, we have a range of projects taking place in the University of Hampton. One of these is around the libraries. And the reason public policy that Hampton picked my research, among others, was because I think it was a key original idea that highlighted something of real value, not just at a kind of a criminological level, but also in terms of the fabric of our local communities in the UK. So in conclusion, is crime and deviance and public disorder in UK libraries a likely story? I would say no, it's not. It's a story that can be told in different ways, that has different ramifications and different meanings in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Ireland, UK, USA, and so on. But what it does need to be done, it does need to be told, and that's what I'm trying to do today. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thanks so much, Brian. We, um, I mean, we don't always hear listen from a researcher from the reflection of the research stages. I really, really enjoyed thoroughly. Um, so I would open uh, the platform now is for any discussion. So I do have some questions, but I will, I will wait for those questions. Okay. Anyone, um, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself and, um, yeah, ask a question. Hello. Um, th thank you. That was really good because it, uh, working in public libraries, I have to say, I'm here today for myself personally. I'm not representing Wolverhampton Libraries yeah. or anything. Um, it's just nice to know that somebody's looking into this because it is something that we all talk about as members of staff in public libraries. And it's something that most of us have, have experienced at some point or another. Um, and I think some of it in our situation is down to the fact that staff are often loan working as well. So you often yeah. have to deal with things as they happen and then it just gets dealt with and finished with. And yes, there might be a policy in place to fill in an incident form and let somebody know. But it might be a low level thing that's happened that you don't have time to deal with then and there. Um, it's finished it's done and although it might have continue to have an impact on you it's not something that maybe even gets logged or told to anybody so there's something in that I think um also just the incidents that female staff experience of stalking behavior is a huge thing um a lot of stuff that I've come into contact with have had um instances where it's it's sort of um a series of again low level seeming incidents that can build up to something that does kind of equal stalking behavior so that might be something to look at as well i don't know if you want to take more questions or can i respond i know jen it's a, more a point but i think it's a very good one that if i could just pick up on and kind of give her some confidence um in terms of that. yes please Brian. thank you um jen just to say to you that um during the interviews to date um inappropriate behavior and consistent or systematic inappropriate behavior by one person to women in a library and then across different libraries in the same local authority area was highlighted to me. So I think it's a really, really good distinction there. And one of the things actually that comes out is that women in my findings so far feel that they've experienced much more um, scenarios than men. And I think there's a very interesting, whatever to be a capital G on us, but there is a definitely a gender argument there that I think needs to be borne in mind by the stakeholder bodies. So absolutely, that's one of the things I'll be going back with. The second thing then about the loan working Yes, one of the reasons I hope to be kind of visit sites during my interviews was kind of to see the different arrangements because some hours libraries have later opening hours in the evening time on the weekends and others are one or two staff or several staff. And this creates a scenario as much as you have police officers who are single ride alongs or dual ride alongs. This has created huge issues from the police unions in the USA. But as you rightly point out, we don't see this issue in England and Wales in terms of library workers who are librarians who are working alone. And the impact it has either straight away or over a period of time in terms of, uh, I suppose, if you want to call it psychological impact or you know, stress and anxiety. So very important issues. Um, and I'm very grateful to you from, from, from where you are in terms of geography for raising that again for me, because it does lend weight to what I've already seen. And I'm really, really thankful for that. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I was quite fascinated with the percentages of um, verbal use and and physical sorry abuse and physical abuse as well. So, did you find what what you find about reporting? Are those people are reporting because what, when we are working in um, safer street research and especially working with people 
who are, I mean, with harassment in public spaces, we find that uh, we have found from, from that research is people don't report. Reporting is much less than the actual incident. So uh, what did you find from, from, because you have quite striking um, uh, statistics from your quantitative yeah, survey? Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of reporting, um, there is a willingness to report, but I don't know if I had raised the question, would that have emerged as a story, I suppose, was one of my concerns. That's why I was eager to ask um, about whether people have reported or not, and then what happened. And then many times the, the follow up there was not, I won't say poor on behalf of others, but it was it was it was lacking. People felt that their manager spoke to them and kind of that was it. Um, and as Jen pointed out, there were policies in place, there were exclusion policies, there was appeals against exclusion policies. But one of the things I was I've been trying to figure out in interviews is how much of the scope there is for the librarian to go, actually, no, you can't let him or her back in because my life was made in misery. And um, so part of the process for me there is, 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 is that reporting and understanding that reporting procedure, but also separately, one of the things I'm trying to do, and I didn't mention it here today, and it's a very fair question, is about getting handle on the incident records. So the incident logs um, were possible. Um, and I'd, I'd had some discussion with one of the stakeholders about this, and it's something I'm aiming to do towards the end of the project, is see, well, how many incidents were actually reported, were actually recorded, and what is the follow-up, and what does the log contain on those? Because, um, as we all know, uh, there's a difference between reported crime and the hidden crime, um, and broadly, if we transfer this across to the libraries, if people aren't reporting, it doesn't get recorded. If it doesn't get recorded, it's a story not known about. So what I've been trying to do is force that question to survey in a gentle way, but if you're pulling it out, I have to admit I am quite surprised at the number who have experienced and reported it, but the follow through either by managers and even more so, more problematic by police, people, librarians have tended to feel it hasn't been quite sufficient. I think there's a, there's a story there and I think there's perhaps some guidance there back to one of the stakeholders in terms of what they could do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, I'm not surprised that you have found that they don't want more um, security like CCTVs, because that's kind of coming from literature as well. All the literatures are currently saying that it's actually impact people's um, in, in also public spaces, isn't it? They don't want more CCTVs, even though there is a contradiction that CCTV actually uh, influenced safety perceptions, isn't it? People feel more safe, but at the same time, you don't want a quite a big number of CCTVs, which is um, sometimes daunting. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think there's, there's a feeling about wanting to be safe, but not about wanting to be watched. Um, mm. And I think that thing about being watched. And um, so if we go back and, and again, and kind of in, in dealing with first year students, um, uh, whether it's in Coventry or in, uh, the University of Southampton, and um, one of the things that comes out there is about CCTV and the, the role as well as the, the tragic death of Jamie Bulger and the impact that had on CCTV over a period of time. And then for the UK to become, as is reported often, the most CCTV country in the world. Um, I think what the university is saying is, what the libraries for me are saying is that, look, from a manager point of view, this is a way for us to record and make sure it's documented. But from a staff point of view, it's like, look, let us get on with our job. This isn't what we're about. We're not, we're not, we're not a security site. Um, and it is, there is that, there's that, that discrepancy and that tension between we want to be safe, but we don't certainly don't want these things on, on our ground. Very quickly, just in terms of CCTV literature, off the top of my head from what I can remember, CCTV is effective in certain things like car parks, but it's not effective in certain other things um, like burglars or otherwise. So even the, the, the overall use of CCTV, as much as um, what are called tasers, the evidence is very, very mixed. Um, and I think I, I have to admit, I was surprised that collectively as a group, my interviewees were coming back saying, no, we don't want CCTV. As I said, it's quite a, there's a gap there or a disjuncture with my survey results. So I'm taking it that there's an instinctive response um, to people saying, yeah, CCTV could be good. But when you sit down with them and kind of reason through to the same, look, the real issue here is about how we deal with people and feeling secure enough to deal with people and knowing that we have the supports behind us to deal with people rather than locking down everything in the library. That's just not going to work and that's not what we're about. 
Yeah, go on. Go on, Jen. Sorry, I don't want to like um, no, no, that's fine. Um, overtake this, but um, yeah, a lot of the issues with CCTV, I think, is that a lot of the libraries, uh, the buildings tend to be older sometimes. And so some buildings in our sort of authority do have CCTV if they're connected to a community centre, for example, whereas other buildings don't have it. So that's that's just something as well to just bear in mind. And I think one of the things that you kind of raised is the thing about Scotland and feeling like they're more kind of part of a wider community hub. Um, and I think if we could get better at partnership working and the library buildings could be real hubs where you've got people from housing in there, you've got people from like recovery services, you've got other people, um, you know, representatives from different council departments that are regularly using the buildings as well. That could be, um, you know, a, a good a good response as well, because then everybody feels a little bit safer. They're working together. You're not on your own. And um, there's other people that you can call on if there's somebody there with maybe addiction issues or mental health issues and you know that you can refer quite quickly and easily if i may I, I'm, I'm very ready for the point i think it is a really good one that's coming out and um, i know that in newcastle uh, i think it was um i'm not gonna remember the name but there's an area in newcastle library that introduced drug awareness services and the community almost revolted against it as the headline the news headline goes so it's interesting to see how far we, i think we can take um I think we need shared services. Absolutely, you're dead right, Jen. I think it's interesting to see how far we can take those into what areas before yeah. the community goes, enough, we're not doing this now. Mm. Um, so I, I think there's a real issue there. I, absolutely, and it's, it's certainly one that I'll be relaying back in kind of the, the final version of our report is about hubs, about bringing those kind of services together and trying to, is there a good model in the UK to emulate? If it is Scotland, what does it look like? And as I said, I'm still trying to scratch and knock on that door to get in that door. To kind of yes. Emulate. Thanks, Brian. Again, we have to, uh, I mean, finish here, but it's it's really, really fascinating. And thanks for coming and shedding some lights on a topic which we actually, I, I mean, I came to know from my ESC conference, but it was it's really fantastic. So thanks also, everyone, for joining us today. And we will upload this on YouTube and share the link. Thanks, Thank you very Brian. much for the time and the invitation. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.